We have been going through a book this spring called Naked Spirituality. And we are coming to a transition point. We are wrapping up a part, a section called perplexity with the word why today. And then in April, we transition into harmony. And I know that many of you are going to really appreciate that transition into harmony, where we start to bring things together a little bit. But we do have one more day in perplexity. In fact, the two title chapters for this week on why, one is called When You Have Come to Zero, and the second one is called Holding the Question Open. Being a person of faith is tricky because it's almost equal parts presence and absence if you're doing it right. Part of coming to zero is ridding yourself of your false self and coming into your true self. This is the exchange, the transformation. Part for us as progressive Christians is holding the questions open because we don't just want to believe different things maybe than we did previously or that we were raised with. We want to believe those things differently. We want to believe in a different way. So it's not just about believing different things. It's about believing those things differently. And part of the way we get there is the why question. It's a dangerous question. So I'm going to invite you to buckle up. <laughs> this might be a little bit of a bumpy ride for some of you, uh, but I want to assure you we will land in a good place. There is a rich tradition in religion and spirituality of asking the why question. In our very Bibles, we have Psalm 42. Now, Psalm 42 is known for the first three verses. It starts, as a deer longs for the flowing stream, so my soul longs after you, O God. Right? And we've actually converted this into a song. As the deer panteth for the water. That psalm takes a turn after that. Let me read you how it ends. And I say to God, my rock, why have you forsaken me? Why must I walk about mournfully because the enemy oppresses me? And with a deadly wound in my body, my adversaries taunt me while they say to me continually, where is your God? Why are you so downcast, O oh my soul? And why are you so disquieted within me? Hope in God, for I shall again praise God, my help. Why is a dangerous question. I want to invite you today to do an experiment. I want you to hold something in your mind as I present to you this framing that I want to. I want you to hold a problem or a crisis. So it might be the invasion of Ukraine. It might be chronic illness. It might be a social problem. I wanna invite you to hold it in your mind today as we ask the why question. Asking the why question is like opening a can of worms, <laughs> to use the old cliche. And once that toothpaste is out of the tube, it is nearly impossible to get it back in. That's why a lot of organized religion does not want or allow people to ask the why question. We, however, at Vermont Hills, we major on the why question. For us, it's part of being a spiritual oasis. 
Because the honest truth is that asking the why question is like lancing a blister. At first, it feels great because it brings relief of that pressure. It's release. But then the raw pain is apparent and the healing must begin. I love the joke that if you have two Jewish rabbis debating any topic, you will have at least three opinions represented. And I think that must be nice because I have three opinions on most subjects just within myself. When I give myself permission to wrestle with the why question, I have three main arguments that seem to compete for the upper hand. So I'm gonna call them this today. The cold hard facts, questioning the question, and blaming the big bad wolf. Those are gonna be my three things today. The cold hard facts, questioning the question, and blaming the big bad wolf. The cold hard facts lead us to stare reality in the face even gazing into the abyss at points. We have been sold a bad version of religion in America. The certainty and confidence of our inherited brands of religion come up short and the answers that we are given ring hollow in the echo chambers of organized religion and institutions of power. We know in the cells of our being deep down in our bones, that the explanations that you and I have been provided are empty of any real power, and thus the ability to make any concrete difference or bring any substantial change to our material circumstances. The world simply does not work the way it has been outlined for us. Bad things happen to good people and good things happen to bad people. The world seems unfair at so many levels and there is no silver bullet or magic words that will fix it. But things, of course, are not that simple. So the second doubt that I struggle with is the question itself. In the age of science and reason that we live in, we seem to be under the false impression that we have access to all of the data and that we would interpret the facts correctly even if we had the entire equation. There are simply too many variables in this equation to think that you or I would be able to solve this riddle even if we could account for all the myriad of contingent elements that have been conflated to conspire to land us in the mire that we find ourselves in. I know you and I know myself. We have limitations, we have agendas, we have flaws and fears that keep us from accounting for and thus attending to the insanely complicated reality that we find ourselves conscripted into in the modern world. Things are incredibly messy in real life and the overlapping mass of variables and influences beats us down and keeps us paralyzed to suffer in silence to self-medicate, and to try our very best to salvage some scrap of meaning out of this short existence. So, we willingly accept the opiate of the people and attempt to distract ourselves with consumption and striving and retail therapy. And then, we blame the big bad wolf. Either that, or we scapegoat those who are victimized and find themselves on the margins. We point the finger at the top of the pyramid of power, or we go after those who are on the outside, or we do both. <laughs> we outsource our pain and frustration. It's like a national pastime. 
We do it with businesses, government, lawyers, mainstream media, social media, and religions. We use words like, in phrases like corporate fraud and congressional corruption and systemic racism and toxic masculinity. We're just trying our best to in some way grasp and frame within the mental tools that we have access to, to explain that something is off. It's more than out of sorts. There is injustice and inequity baked in to the bread at a foundational level. Why does this stuff happen? You might be aware that I subscribe to a perfect storm theory of crisis. So for something to become really critical, like an emergency, you probably have at least three smaller storms that have converged to form this larger crisis. And that's why I really appreciate in our book, Naked Spirituality, that it includes a section on perplexity when it comes to the spiritual journey in the life of faith. Things are not just complex, they're complicated and often perplexing. If it were simple, I tell myself, things would already be fixed. The reason that problems linger and are not resolved is that there are overlapping and mutually inflaming ingredients to our complicated scenario. So in the perfect storm theory of crisis, you have to say that it is all three of these categories I have named, that the facts as we see them just are not lining up and the old explanations simply don't work. Two, we don't have access to all the data and in our limitations and fears, we try our best to make sense of things, but ultimately we come up short. Three, Somebody is to blame, and maybe more than just one somebody. <laughs> Why is this happening? There has to be some answers, but we know that none of the explanations we've been given will fix it. So there must be something else going on that I don't know yet that is extremely disconcerting. But I know that ultimately somebody has to be responsible. Otherwise, this whole thing is unacceptable and somewhere between infuriating and depressing. At minimum, it's discouraging and disorienting. I'm left to ask the why question. I know it's bigger than just me. It's more than I can wrap my head around. The why question initially feels liberating, but what follows is disillusionment and unsatisfying existential malaise, even a crisis of faith or a crisis of conscience. So as your pastor, I want to say, welcome to the Lenten journey. This is why we need Easter with its new life and its promise of resurrection. This is why God had to die. This is why we must pass through Good Friday. I can't be left to stare into the void and fall into the abyss. And I assure you, you have not been left alone. For on the other side of the desert of criticism, we long to be called. Part of being a community of faith is walking this thing out together and creating a safe space to ask tough questions. 
The why question is dangerous. And I absolutely understand why a lot of different kinds of religious communities shy away from it and much prefer the answer and the rule book and the guidelines, the bylaws and the doctoral statements. Asking the why question is tough. And for us, part of being a spiritual oasis is giving space to come to the end of our false self in the hopes of finding our true self. But what that means is that we not only believe different things than we used to, we believe them differently. Asking the why question is part of how we release the pressure, and relieve the pain so that we can begin the healing. But part of it is not just believing different things than we used to, but believing them differently. It's a journey and we're on it together. So I'm glad you're here. This is a safe space to ask tough questions. This is part of why I love being in a tradition that has seasons like Lent that are not all victory and glory and certainty and volume and we sit, we sit with the heaviness of reality sometimes, knowing that we don't have all the answers and trying to grow more comfortable with that. 